So I got an email question from one of my YouTube watchers named Eric. And I gotta tell you guys, as a university professor, I hate it when students ask questions. I can't stand it. I'm of course being sarcastic. I absolutely love it when students ask questions, especially questions that I don't know the answers to because I try afterwards to look them up. And in doing so, I discover that I actually learn. And by learning, I become a better person, a better teacher, and a better professor, a better researcher, and a better scientist. So thank you for your questions, and thank you, Eric, for asking me this one. Fortunately, this happens to be a question that I do know the answer to, or at least I think I do. So I'm going to try my best to tackle it. Here's sort of the rundown. I've uh, told you guys in previous videos that if you take a carboxylic acid like this one and you expose it to excess ammonia or uh, other amines, you can displace the OH and replace it with an NH2. Now, the question that Eric asked is, well, here it is. NH3 is a weaker base than OH minus. I'll go ahead and write that down. NH3 is a weaker base than OH minus. And that is an absolute fact. Now, here's the question. <clears throat> if NH3 is a weaker base, in other words, less reactive than hydroxide, OH minus, then how in the world can NH3 displace an OH minus in this type of reaction? Well, let's go ahead and tackle that thing. Here's sort of the, uh, the really short and quick answer to that. What's actually happening is you're not displacing an OH minus with an NH3. In net, you're displacing an H2O with an NH2 minus. That's what's happening in net. Now, I'll show you or prove that to you momentarily. Now, if you look at these two guys, holy crap, NH2 minus is way more reactive than H2O. It's a way more powerful base slash nucleophile than water. Way more powerful. So that does not look that difficult. It doesn't look difficult to displace an H2O with an NH2 minus. But that brings us back to this. Is that really what we're doing? I'm adding NH3. I'm not adding NH2 minus to this. So how in the world, Mike, can you deduce or, or, or claim that, what, that this is what's actually happening? The answer is through a proton transfer. Let me show you by drawing out the mechanism. In this reaction, what occurs is the lone pairs on the nitrogen come in and kick that carbonyl on the crotch, pumping the electrons up onto that oxygen. I'll go ahead and draw uh, some arrows here. That gives me this intermediate. You'll notice, of course, that this nitrogen is positively charged. This oxygen is negatively charged as these electrons go up onto it. Now, at this stage, you might think, now, wait a minute. Can't this OH minus just come down, reform a double bond, and kick the NH3 off? And then, wouldn't it be better to kick an NH3 off than to kick an OH minus off? Because an NH3 that's positively charged, I mean, as it is, would be a better leaving group than an OH minus, wouldn't it? Because I'm kicking off what would end up being a neutral group versus something that would end up being a charge group. So doesn't it make sense that this guy's just going to come back down and kick that NH3 off? The answer is absolutely freaking lootly it does. And it will. And in fact, it does. This OH minus does come down here and kick that NH3 off and goes backwards. It totally does. But that's the reason why I've drawn this equilibrium arrow, this back and forth arrow, if you will, because this happens back and forth and back and forth probably a lot. The reason that this eventually moves forward is because we add excess NH3. I'm inundating this reaction with tons of ammonia. So I can get ammonia going in there. And granted, at this stage, some of this, uh, the, this is going to revert backwards by having these electrons pump down here to reform the double bond and kicking off the NH3 to go backwards to where I came from. And that's going to happen. It's going to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. But keep in mind, I'm inundating this with an excess of NH3. So there's tons of NH3 around. And every once in a while, just every so often, you'll have this O minus reach around and grab one of those protons. Now, I realize that that looks like a really far distance on paper. But if you actually build a model and look at it three-dimensionally, it isn't that far away. This is only one, two, three, four, four atoms away. Not that long of a distance. When that occurs, we end up getting this intermediate. Hopefully, you can see that. Well, what happens next? Well, what happens is in solution, there's going to be some 
small amount of ammonium that is protonated NH3, protonated NH3. And that often arises by adding a catalytic amount of acid to this reaction, uh, or it can also be generated mechanistically as I'll show you. But usually when you run this reaction, you might want to add a little bit of catalytic acid. What happens next? Well, one of these OHs, and it doesn't matter which one, reaches out and grabs that proton and pumps these electrons into that nitrogen to neutralize it. You can imagine that happening. Now, granted, you could also imagine this nitrogen doing that. If the nitrogen instead grabbed a proton, it would go backwards to this. And does that happen? Yeah, it does. But remember, I've got tons and tons of ammonia, and so by Le Chatelier's principle, these equilibrium arrows are going to be pushed further and further and further to the right just by sheer volume. This guy grabs that hydrogen and that gives me this. Now do you see what I was getting at earlier? I was telling you that in net what's actually happening because of proton transfer, sorry that should be an NH2, is we are displacing not an OH- with an NH3, we are displacing an H2O with an NH2. At this stage, you can imagine <coughs> lone pairs on this oxygen coming down to form a double bond and kicking off water. Now, of course, at this stage, H2O, that is protonated oxygen, way better leaving group than NH2 minus. If this folds down here to form a double bond, it is not going to kick off an NH2 minus. NH2 minus would not be a good leaving group. So that takes me to this. And of course, this uh, uh, oxygen here is still protonated. And so I'm going to have some of my excess NH3 that's in solution remove that proton, pump that in there, and take me. And you can imagine, I suppose, to a certain degree, this might be slightly reversible, but not super duper reversible. Anyway, I deprotonate with an NH3, and that takes me to my final product and gives me my protonated NH3, my ammonium, that was used right here. Here's the deal. This arrow is a one-way arrow. Why? because this molecule is thermodynamically much more stable than this one. So what drives this ultimately is two things. First of all, thermodynamically, this is at a much more stable, lower energy level than the starting material. We call that a thermodynamic sink. Secondly, we have uh, an excess amount of ammonia which basically at each of these back and forth or reversible steps is going to in net push it forward and forward and forward enough that once, once it gets into here, it's not going back. And probably, there's probably once you get to about here, I think right at this step, it might not actually be reversible anymore because once you protonate that oxygen, it's, it might be really tough to get to, well, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't, one, of the, one of these steps over here is where there's basically no going back. There's a committed step. This is definitely much more thermodynamically stable than the starting material. And the reason is because this is an amide bond. The nitrogen in here can resonance to localize into that carbonyl much more prevalently than the oxygen over here can. The oxygen here does it as well, but not as prevalently as the nitrogen. And the reason is because nitrogen is less electronegative than oxygen. It doesn't want to hog its electrons as much as an oxygen, hence can resonance to localize a little bit much. The electronegativity difference between the nitrogen and oxygen might seem like a subtlety, but in reality ends up uh, having tremendous ramifications. You might uh, recognize this as an amide bond, and I'll go ahead and write amide. For uh, anyone who's watching this from uh, Great Britain, I think, and Australia, you guys might pronounce it amide. Uh, sorry, we uh, Yankees out here say amide. Here's the point. <clears throat> amide bonds are very, very stable thermodynamically. That's a good thing. The reason is because amide bonds are the primary structural component of peptides. When you talk about a peptide bond, that is bonds between multiple amino acids in a protein, those are amide bonds between amino acids. Why in the world do we care that an amide bond is more thermodynamically stable than a carboxylic acid OH bond? The reason is because it, if it weren't more stable, then an OH could displace an NH2 very, very easily. That would be bad because what it means is that if I drank water, the water, the H2O would come in here, well, would come in here, electrons would go up, electrons would go down, and it would ultimately kick off an NH3 leaving group if this weren't more stable. And every time I drank water, it would dissolve my proteins. That would really, really suck, and life couldn't exist if this bond weren't stronger than this bond. So that's kind of cool. Here's one other thing that I want to tell you. Even though this reaction does happen, and believe me, it does,
as you can imagine, it's not very efficient. It requires an excess amount of ammonia and you usually have to heat it up to get over some of the, the thermodynamically difficult steps such as uh, well, this, this deprotonation or this proton transfer and, and maybe this one and you might have to add some catalytic acid <clears throat> and that could be a problem if you've got a compound where this uh, R group has something in it that's acid sensitive. So frequently when I do this in the lab, and in fact I usually prefer this uh, way that I'm going to show you momentarily to any of this crap that I just showed you here, I would much rather displace an OH and a carboxylic acid with a nitrogen and amine by just taking uh, my amine, and I can go ahead and write down NH3 if you like, uh, and adding a coupling reagent like DCC. Now coupling reagents I've talked about, um, there are lots of different coupling reagents, and I'll put a link to discussion on them. I'm not going to go into depth on what DCC is, or it looks like you can look that up on Wikipedia if you want. I will just tell you this, DCC is a really cool molecule, and there are lots of other molecules like it. There are other coupling reagents, that's what they're called. Uh, they allow an OH to basically become a, a better leaving group and allow it to be more easily displaced by a nitrogen to form an amide. And once again, this is thermodynamically much more stable than the starting material. So once you get here, it's very, very difficult to go backwards, which is great. But uh, that's the way I typically run these things. These reactions with uh, any type of uh, uh, amide forming coupling reagent like DCC are very, very efficient and usually high yielding and you can run them at room temperature in a few hours usually and they work beautifully. So Eric, that's the answer to your question and anyone else who's interested in it, there you go. Ah, <laughs> oh, that's fun. Anyway, until uh, next time, have an enjoyable rest of your day.